It's Mr. Gibson. Good afternoon. Welcome to the November meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stair and I'm the president. I'm glad to have you here this afternoon. Is there anybody here for the very first time? Very first time. Okay, I thought everybody looked familiar. Thank you. At this point, we're going to have Richard Robinstein read the minutes from the October 2nd meeting. The uh, program meeting Jonathan opened as he did this e this evening with the uh, at welcoming all attendants, and there was no new attendees at that meeting as well. I read the minutes of the August 22, 28th meeting. Uh, Margaret Burke gave the treasury report uh, membership was at 123, 32 new, renewed for two-year memberships, five new members, four deceased from last year, 23 have not renewed, and a letter was going to be sent as a reminder, and there's 20 life members, uh, one withdrew, and nine family. Um, the, 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 yeah. <laughs> the treasury report was approved and is submitted as as followed as it was. Okay. <laughs> Nicole Smith announced upcoming events and activities for the York County or the yeah, York County History Center. Advised that this program was being recorded as it is today and will be available at the York History Center YouTube channel. For more information on the program, visit www.yorkhistorycenter.org. A reminder, after that period was the October uh, Oyster Fest that was being held on October 17, 2022. Jonathan displayed the Henry James Young plaque and showed where the the new the lettering was purchased with the uh, treasury report. And where it was placed out on the plaque of uh, Richard Kunkel. Went over the upcoming events for the year, Sunday, November 6th, which is today. He'll be re revisiting online research on the Germans' ancestry. There will be no meeting in December. Uh, Sunday, January 8th meeting, uh, need, looking for a better title instead of show and tell. <laughs> uh, members uh, come and share their findings. So we're, so we're going to. That's going to be revisited and while well, you're, yeah. It'll be in the newsletter. <laughs> Sunday, February 5th is Rodney Barnett, who has been doing extensive work on his own genealogy work as an organist. Uh, yeah. A pup, is, I am drawing a blank. The pup, the Pesciaco. Church. Oh, Episcopal. Episcopal. Thank you. I can only say that. I don't know why I'm dunked on. Episcopal Church in town with some diverse African American in him while working with DNA. Sunday, March 5th is Jonathan Stair uh, will speak, um, which he hasn't told us exactly what that one was at this point. Sunday, April 2nd will be Taylor Stump. Who was in? Who was with the Pennsylvania Archive, Archives? Will speak on prison records. And Sunday, May seventh, tour of St. Luke's Union Church Cemetery, and they are celebrating their 250th anniversary. And that will be presented by June Lloyd and Jean Robertson. And the Sunday, June eleventh meeting is still uh, still being set up at this time. Okay, thank you, Richard. Any uh, corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, they'll uh, stay and approved as read. I think um, I think you had it correct. Gene's last name is Robinson. 
not Robert's son, but uh, oh. you might have it correct in, in your written part. Too. I probably wouldn't do a mispronouncement. <laughs> okay. So this time we'll have Margaret Berg, our treasurer, come and uh, share the treasury report oh. and the membership report. Okay, the balance uh, at September 30th, 2022 was $16,789.55. Receipts for the month of October, membership renewals $295, one new uh, member $60, publication sales $25, donations $10, total of $390 for October. Disbursements, postal connections for the July-August newsletter, $112.55. For Charles Kaufman, program speaker, $125. And to the American Cancer Society, a donation of $100. Uh, and there was an additional uh, fee for the uh, processing of it. It was $105.50. Yeah, it was a memoriam for the Bird family. Um, net cash balance at October 31st, 2022, $16,836.50. Membership, uh, as of uh, the end of October, we have 131 members, eight renewed last month, uh, not renewed, 15. We had one new for the month and six for the year. And for two, the two year renewal, which was new this year, and we wanted to see how that would go. We had 34 members take up the uh, two year renewal. See, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Nicole? Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming this afternoon. I'm Nicole Smith from the History Center. Just a couple of announcements before we move on to the speaker. Uh, if you're watching at home, please put any questions in the chat or comments feature on Facebook. Uh, coming up this week on Thursday, November 10th, there is a presentation at the Appel Center called Countdown to the Future. And it's about the new History Center Museum, Library and Archives set to open in 2024. Uh, this weekend, November 12th, is Articles of Confederation Day at the Colonial Courthouse. Highly recommend you come this year. Lots of activities and reenactors are planned, as well as original documents to share. Um, November 16th, the Civil War Roundtable speaker is Cody Ash. Um, oh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Bradley and Linda Gottfried are the speakers talking about Lincoln and the creation of Soldiers National Cemetery. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And I just want to reemphasize one thing Nicole mentioned. This Thursday at four o'clock down at the Appel Center will be the History Center's presentation on the new building and facility. So if you have questions, what it's going to look like, what, where things are going to be, uh, please plan to attend that. And they, they will have, I think, some drawings and pictures, and you can get an idea of how things will look in the new building. I do want to thank all those who helped staff our table at the Oyster Festival. That includes our secretary, Richard Robinstein, our vice president, Richard Kunkel, our director of publications, Erica Runkles, our director at large, Mindy Sowers, Becky Ann Stein, and I don't see her, was helping as well, our treasurer, Margaret Berg, and Tom Gibson was floating around <laughs> throughout the afternoon. So thank you for staffing our table there. We didn't have a lot of visitation, but I think the people that stopped by were very interested in what we had to share. And some of you were very helpful in trying to give people ideas of where else to look in their, in their family history. So thank you. Also want to reemphasize that in December, we will not be having a meeting. So our next meeting after this one will be the first or the second Sunday in January, since the first Sunday is January the 1st. Our speaker this afternoon is our own Vice President, Richard Kunkel. As I was trying to think about what to say about Richard, um, a lot of things came to mind. Other than being our vice president, he is also an attorney with the CGA law firm here in town. And some of you probably know this, but he plays the cello in New York Symphony Orchestra. 
So he has 30 a multi years this month. 30 years. Oh, so, uh, he is a multi talented person. <laughs> and this afternoon, actually, I should preface what he's going to talk about by saying that Richard, many of us consider Richard one of the most knowledgeable people about your county families. I know, as other people have said, anytime a family's name comes up, you mention Richard knows somebody who knows something about that family. He's also done a lot of research overseas, uh, either in person or through the internet. And that's what his presentation is gonna be about this afternoon, using uh, online resources for uh, German research. So Richard, if you wanna come and tell us about upcoming programs and jump right into your uh, presentation. Thank, Thank you, you, Jonathan. Our secretary, Richard Robinstein, really covered what the future programs are. I don't have too much to tell. Um, January is sharing your findings, and I hope some of you have something to share, because right now I don't have anything to share, so um, we need someone to fill up that program, and I'm sure you will, will come out and bring some good things along with you. Uh, February is Rodney Barnett, who will um, just spoke with him yesterday, and he's very enthusiastic about that. He hasn't spoken to us for quite some time, and he has ancestors from Botetourt County, Virginia, and Mississippi, so, and um, as with all of us, has probably found a lot since he last talked to us. Uh, then in March is our president, uh, Jonathan Stair on Pennsylvania Civil War draft records. So we look forward to that. And uh, Tyler Stump from Pennsylvania State Archives will be in April on Pennsylvania prison records. Um, so you might not think you have anyone in prison, but if you search deep enough, you know, they always said you'd find that horse thief. So, uh, and then, uh, that was April, then um, May is uh, the, the tour of St. Luke's Cemetery in Bridgeville. And um, June Floyd is here today, and it's also with Gene Robinson. So we're looking forward to that. And I still don't have a program for June. So if anyone has any real bright ideas, let me know. Pondering that, I should have something for you by the next time we meet. Okay, well, I guess I will dive into the presentation. Um, first, I thought about doing this all online, and I'm so glad I didn't do that. So it's screenshots. And then I was looking at this title. The reason I called it Revisiting, I did a program sort of similar to this a number of years ago. However, a lot has changed, so that's why we're revisiting. And then I was sort of pondering, you know, Germans quite a lot this past week or so because of this program. And that is like a German title. If I just would have put the verb there at the end, that would be a perfect <laughs> German title, you know. The online research of German ancestors revisited or something. That sounds very German. They they have these long ponderous titles for things, and I guess I did that as well. Okay, so you have a handout. I hope you all have one. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the main websites, and we're going to sort of start with the one that's the easiest to use, and it's free, is familysearch.org. So we can all use this. It's free. You can use it at home. Um, or you can use it at a family history center. There is one up at Hollywood Drive. I haven't been there since before the pandemic. However, thanks to the good services of Lynn Nelson, our own library here at the York County History Center is an affiliated library. So almost anything that you can access at the Family History Center, you can access here, which is really pretty wonderful. Um, the reason I have the little drop down menu there, how I usually go about searching for things, Germans are very parochial about things, okay? You want to get down into the nitty gritty if you know the nitty gritty about where someone's from. So I oftentimes use the catalog. You can do just searching records, which would be like using names of individuals. But if you really know where someone's from, you want to go and get into the catalog. and. I have a number of ancestors actually on both my father and my mother's side who are from the town of Eppingen, which is in Baden, which of course is Germany. Now, the way um, the LDS organized how you find things is by the old German empire that ended in 1918 with the end of World War I. And it probably makes a lot of sense that they did that, um, as we will see with some of the church records, because a lot of the church archives that still exist are from these various principalities, duchies, and former kingdoms that existed in 1918 at the end of World War I. 
um, which is kind of an odd thing, but it helps to know that. So if you look that up, that comes up, if you look at again, and then which, when you pull up what records there are, there are quite a few records available. Now, the, the primary records that you use with German research are church records. There are some civil records for things that were under the Second German Empire. That would be the, the one that ended in 1918. Um, for things that were under the jurisdiction of the Kingdom of Prussia, those only start in 1876. So civil records are relatively recent. Um, certain places that were under Napoleon earlier on started in the early 1800s that you will find in the Rhineland and so forth that they had civil records that started during that era. But a lot of times civil records, 1876. And as you can see there, there really are no civil records for this town. This town uh, was originally a Palatine town, meaning it was part of the Electoral Palatinate. Then at the end of um, the Napoleonic Wars, actually before that, it became part of the Grand Duchy of Baden. It remained part of Baden until, uh, it's actually still part of Baden, but of course today Baden is mixed with Württemberg as one state. They lump those two states together. Although don't tell a Württemberger that they're from Baden and don't tell them they, they have different sorts of personalities and outlooks. The Badeners will tell you that the Württembergers are cheap people and, and there's all kinds of things. They have different, there's lots of local prejudices, shall we say. I'm being kind about that. So church records is what we're going to look at here. And you can see there's five. And the family search uses a lot of German um, words. So it helps to know what they mean. Kirchen book just means church book, OK? And Evangelische Kirche, that is the Protestant church, OK? Catholic uh, Kirche, that is the Catholic church. And then you have a Kirchen book, I, that one I didn't highlight, it's from the Austrian army from during the war, French Revolutionary Wars uh, had, um, had a church there. Uh, they, you know, I guess they had soldiers that were stationed there that were fighting the French. And then you have these church book duplicates, Kirchen book duplicat, which are from 1791 to 1870. So those were sent to the higher church authorities. They would make a complete duplicate of the church record. And that would be for the, the Protestant church. And they also had it for the Catholic church. Uh, since they didn't have civil records, I think that those records, um, we'll swear 100%, but um, I think they were used by the civil authorities as vital records, basically. Um, during that time period. There's also a change, especially in the Catholic records, you'll notice that if you use them. Um, in this whole area, a large part of Baden was part of some different prince archbishoprics or prince bishoprics. I have a lot of ancestors on my grandmother's side, the prince bishopric of Speyer. Speyer is on the west side of the Rhine, but a whole bunch of that territory was on the east side, all sort of intermingled with uh, the electoral palatinate, those lands that were over there, such as today, there's no part of the Rhineland faults, the Rhineland palatinate, which is on the east side of the Rhine, that's all Baden-Württemberg at this point. Um, is what happened after the Napoleonic period, all the Catholic church records go from Latin to German. So um, surprisingly, in my research, I found other places like Austria, which were Catholic all along, had German church records very early um, rather than Latin. Um, this area has a lot of Latin records up to about 1810. So then you get in, uh, if you click on that, um, again, you have terminology. Taufen is baptisms. And you'll see here, this is the Protestant church, the Evangelische Kirche. So we have Reformierta, which is the Reformed. And we have um, Lutheran, and it should say Lutheran here, Lutherish or something along those lines. In this town, you had both churches. They were separate churches at one point. So you actually had a Catholic church, you had the Reformed church, which was actually the biggest of the congregations, and the Lutheran church in this Palatine town. Um, for the longest period of time, the Lutheran church was actually a separate building in this town. The Catholics and the Protestants, because there was a war of the Palatine succession, the French imposed that they had to observe what was called a simultaneum, 
they had to share the church building. So you would have a Protestant service maybe at nine o'clock and then the Catholic service at 11 o'clock or something along those lines. Um, they had to share and, and use the same building. And that was also in Alsace, other areas where the French had a lot of sway. But that happened a lot in the Palatinate. And then sort of as a result of that, I guess things that happened naturally, you, you get, um, this was from like the 1680s that this happened on. Um, you get mixed marriages. You get people that, you know, well, they kind of keep meeting up with these Catholics or Protestants and then they intermarry. So, um, you know, Lutheran and reform marriages, we don't think of those quite so much. So the other words to look in there, uh, hierotin in the LDS catalog is marriages and totin are deaths. Uh, confirmandin is confirmations. And I'm trying to think what else they have. They sort of have like different account things. Um, what you need to look at is over the whole side there, the whole way over on the right. So the little hour or the little magnifying glass, that is an index. And if you click on that, that will bring, and I'll show you that here in a minute. And then you also have, you'll see there's a camera that doesn't have anything marked. I did this at my office, so I, I didn't have access to a family history uh, library or I wasn't back here doing it. So um, you have access to those images. However, the one here that has some of the oldest records from the 1660s, 1640s, um, it's film number that ends in 25, that shows a reel of microfilm. It does not show um, a little camera. So the only thing that's available on is microfilm through the LDS. You can't see images of that. It's not available. And because the LDS, you can't rent microfilm anymore. If you want to see that particular microfilm that is held by the LDS, you would have to go to Salt Lake City in order to look at that. Now, I will tell you that that particular microfilm, I haven't used it in ages, but it should still be up at the Family History Center here in York. Um, however, there's other sources that you can access these records, which I will be showing you later, but you can access for free, actually, most of these uh, at your at your own house. Okay, so that was the index I went on. Um, the family that my mother comes from is the Heininger family, and they lived here for a couple generations. They came to York County in about 1820. And the guy there at the top, born in 1784, he was the father of the family who came in 1820. So that shows the actual record there on the right, his christening place, um, the dates of birth, the father's name, the mother's name. Um, so and then it says view record. Now, this is what I know you can't read this. This is how they digitalized the microfilm. OK, so each one of those is like the open book, two pages, and then you can kind of click along on those. So this is the actual page where it's found, and it's over on the right-hand side, the third one from the bottom. If you can read, it says Johannes, and then it has the parents, and then it has the sponsors, and it has the dates of birth and baptism. And I don't, you can probably barely see it here. Um, he's the one there's kind of hiding out there at the very bottom. There's an index. So you can pull up the actual, what's found on that page. If you can't read things, you can actually scroll through that. I will say this, the LDS ones, I think they have several people check through them to make sure for accuracy. Um, and they're not bad. Those indexes are actually pretty good. Now, the one thing I would tell you, I think they're fairly complete, but there's no guarantee that just because it says it's indexed that every single page in that book is indexed for all the records. Um, that might be a work in progress for all I know. I, I just assume that it is, but you know what they always say about assuming things. It's not always a very good idea. So this is the Catholic record uh, for the same town. And it's found in the uh, Erzbischof, uh, Erzbischof Archive Freiburg. The archives of the Archbishop of Freiburg, which covers the whole of what was the Grand Duchy of Baden. If you will note over there on the far side, there's a little key above the camera. That means that you cannot access those records to look at them at home, but you can if you come here to the History Center or if you go to the Family History Center uh, here in York up at the LDS Church. And uh, 
Okay. Now, that church doesn't list this. A lot of the Catholic churches in the, in the Archdiocese of Freiburg, uh, it indicates right there in red letters that they're available online. There's a big database for them. For some reason, Eppingen is not showing that, which I don't know why. So this is another town called Rauenberg, which is pretty close by where I have a lot of ancestors, a lot of Catholic ancestors from um, several lines of my grandmother's family. So if you click on that, one of her ancestors is Vitus, Georg Vitus Stang. So I put his name in. Um, and there he's right at the top there. That's his baptism. They basically give you information about that. So if you're tracking someone down in these Catholic records, there's this big database. Um, you can search. They might be in a neighboring town. They might be somewhere within that archdiocese, and you can find them. Uh, however, to get the image, you would have to come to an affiliated library with the LDS. Then there's a nice user's guide for that that kind of explains a lot of things, what you can find in that database. And interestingly, they have a whole list of various other databases. Now, some of these databases are quite large and some are quite small. Okay. I know that's kind of a, doesn't say a whole lot, but uh, this one's pretty big. If you have Catholic ancestors from Southwest Germany, you could probably find them. It's the one there at the top. Um, we talked about those church book duplicates. That's probably for the Protestant churches. Stebach, though, is just one little town. So that's a database just for that one town. For some reason, that rates there. Uh, then the Diocese of Augsburg, they have those. That's in Bavaria. Um, some civil and church books. I don't think that's complete for Hessen Nassau. That's uh, would be like Wiesbaden and Darmstadt, that area. Um, which is north of the Palatinate area. Um, and then you have some that are real vague, like, you know, German Lutheran baptisms, marriage. It could be any place in the country. Diocese of Munster, the Diocese of Limburg, um, Paderborn, that's nor northern Germany. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things here. So if you have unknown German ancestors that you don't know where they're from, this would be a real good place to start just to kind of go through these databases because it's free. They might not be completely complete. They might not be completely accurate, but you could find things. And some of these databases, I don't have any direct information. But I think they've been put on Ancestry as well, that they've shared them. So they'll show up if you have the right Ancestry plan, they'll show up on Ancestry. Uh, the other end of Baden-Württemberg is the last one listed there. Uh, Württemberg, Diocese of Rotenburg, Stuttgart. That is the Catholic uh, records for what was the former kingdom of Württemberg, so the other part of Baden-Württemberg. Oh, okay. Talking about records that are only available in Salt Lake. For some reason, the church archive for Hessen-Nassau, that would be the actual church archive is in Darmstadt. For the Mormons, there's some that are available, but I don't think any are available on the LDS site. There's some available on Archeon, which we will talk about soon, but there are a whole bunch that the only place that they are available would be in Salt Lake City or in Darmstadt would be the only place where you could do them to research them for that area. And um, hey, Hank Jones and Annette Berger wrote a book about um, immigrants from the Westerwald it's a little bit, it's in the Rhineland plot in it, but it's under <coughs> Darmstadt for the church archive. So all the records from that Westerwald region, none of them are accessible through uh, the LDS site, Family Search. The only play, and they're not, you can't rent, rent the microfilm, um, and they're not on Archeon, quite a few of them at this point. Um, the only place you can research those would be um, in Darmstadt or in Salt Lake City, where you get a private researcher in Germany to go to Darmstadt. Okay, Ancestry.com, the, the Goliath that's out there, has a lot of good things about it, and there's a lot that's so-so. Mm, um, big thing is cost for some people. I use it practically on a daily basis. 
So, you know, it's like over $300 to have full access to everything. The German records that are available on Ancestry are only if you have the top two tier plans, which are pretty expensive. If you just have things for the United States, you're not going to get them. That being said, for me, it's been well worth it because certain things have popped up about people that I otherwise would not have found. Now, for, we were just talking about Protestant records in Baden. There's no images for any, but they have a database, which they've sort of cleaned up uh, for Protestant records. I have some issues with this. This is an ancestor of mine who actually ended up going to what's Ukraine now, um, and he's Protestant. Um, but the Hochstetten, Preussen, Preussen is Prussia, Baden. Bought, the Grand Duchy of Baden was never part of Prussia. Why in the world they're listing this like this? I have no idea. Some of the things that used to be a big problem, like people that were from Epping and they had little villages outside of Epping and, and they were listing that the church record was from this little village called Reichen. And you go to that church record and you're not going to find them there because they're, they're mislabeling things. That's probably my biggest complaint about ancestry is they mislabel things. And I don't know about you, I used to call them up and give them heck about some of these things. Now you can't call them up. <laughs> you can't call them. You can't tell them anything. So it's, it's like, okay, I don't know what you do. But there was uh, some of the Wurttemberg records. It was early on. They have, have a great database of Wurttemberg records that are indexed. But they must have had someone in the Philippines do the indexing that couldn't read German script. And they had deaths from the 1620s, and they always started like the, which is like Dane or Dame. Okay. So they said everyone was named David, and they said they were baptisms, not deaths. So, how would you would ever find anything? They had David, they don't know the last name. They had a date, but they said they were baptisms and they were all deaths. Yeah, big problem. And if they paid someone for that, they should have got their money back. Uh, this was one that I couldn't recreate the search. This search helped me find an ancestor, a Louisa born in the year 1800 when they first started with the Wurttemberg um, database that they had. And it gave me the first one that came up was the one who turned out with DNA and other records together. And I sort of suspected she might be. She was the wife of Gottlieb Gels, who was my fourth great grandfather. And she was my fourth great grandmother. Um, I couldn't recreate that search now, so it's good I did the search right when it came up, because for some reason, I even corrected on, they had the wrong name, they had it wrong, the name, the last name, and Palmer was her last name, and they had that wrong, but I couldn't re recreate anything, I had corrected it, you know, you can correct things on Ancestry and put that in, but Palmer didn't even show up, which is kind of weird. That's her actual baptism. Um, and this is not a course about reading German script. So um, I, I'll, I'll give my little elevator speech about reading old handwriting. First of all, we have a real crisis in this country because young people only print their names, only print to write, usually don't write anything. There was a recent article in the Atlantic Magazine by a president of Harvard University who taught a history course about the Civil War and distributed Civil War letters to her students and discovered that none of the students could read any of the letters and said they had no idea what they said because they didn't know cursive handwriting to save their life. Okay, this is a big pet peeve of mine because 95% of our history is handwritten prior to 1900. It's just the way it is, okay? And the best way to learn how to read this handwriting, pretty much, I'm probably one of the younger people in this room, okay? And I can read it fine. And once you can read stuff, it's like, it's incomprehensible that people can't read it, okay? But if they can't read it, it just goes over their head. And it's, it's really, it's a, it's a crisis about just cursive handwriting in this country. Um, in Germany, very, very few people can read this old German script. Towards the end of World War II, uh, this was called Suterling script. It's the old Gothic handwriting that was used for centuries. And it varies from writer to writer. 
Um, but at the end of World War II, the Nazis said that there were some Hebrew characters in this script and they stopped teaching it. They started teaching instead Latin script, which is pretty close to what we write. And so most modern Germans can't read this. This is a problem for them. Very, very few can actually read it who are modern Germans. A good tip for all of you and for me as well, the best way to learn how to read any kind of handwriting is to learn how to write it. The reason that we as older people can read cursive handwriting is because we were taught it, the Palmer method with all the loops and the, all that sort of thing. I'm going way past my 40 second elevator speech. Sorry about this. But if you learn how to write it, you can read it. Same goes for this. Henry Young years ago, when he was in the Hoffman Orphanage over in Adams County, he thought in order to learn the German language, you needed to learn how to write in the German script. And they had a book that had the German script and he taught himself to write it. And is what happens is that does something in your brain once you write in that script. If you just write dumb words, your name, whatever, and then you learn it's, it becomes really familiar to you that you can read it. And there's all kinds of places online where you can see the German letters and that stuff. So if you really want to learn how to read this stuff, see, I look at it now and it's like, yeah, that's what that is. But I say that to you and you say, this looks like Greek. I can't, you know, it's like the Egyptian hieroglyphics before they had the Rosetta Stone. Okay. And um, that's not, it doesn't help you that much. I think you can probably pick things out with this, but this is from 1800. That's her baptism. Uh, you know, it says Natus, which is Latin for born, and Re Natus, that's baptized over here to the far left. Infantes, that's the child, Luisa Heinrica, and then a very interesting there, it says Nach North America. It says she went to North America. So that shows that she left. Then it has the parents, and there's a reference to the family register on page 326. And actually, her father came in 1834 with the sister and uh, two children, and also her brother came and was buried in Friesville Cemetery. A whole bunch of this family came here, and her brother, her father was still living in 1840 in Windsor Township, I'm pretty sure. Um, her mother had died before that, and her maiden name was Eckert. She was Elizabeth. He's Johann David or David Palmer. He was a weaver. That means he was a weaver. And then at the end, there you have the sponsors. Okay, so records that I wouldn't have otherwise found if I wasn't on Ancestry.com. This is my great-great-grandfather, Carl Conkle, who I had always been told he lived to be really old. Well, I never found his death record. He was born in 1855. Well, he moved as an old, older man with his son who moved a couple counties away to the east in what was East Prussia. He lived in West Prussia. And this showed up in this very weird database Hesse, Hesse Castle, Hesse Darmstadt, Hesse Marburg, Hesse Rheinfels, Rhineland and Baldeck. This is in East Prussia. This is out in what's now Poland. Why it's in this database, I have no idea. And actually, I think the original record, I have an idea what happened. The original record is in Berlin now. I think is what happened is the pastor, when the Soviets came in, took the book with him, and it may have passed through some the archive, one of these Hessian archives, he might have ended up there. I think he fled with that book because it was the current church register. That's my guess. But I found his death. I wouldn't have found it otherwise. And this is just shows his baptism. There's an image of a lot of the eastern parts of, of Germany. I have a lot of ancestry there. Probably most of you do not. But they have, it's pretty good coverage in ancestry. But again, place names, it goes back and forth. This is the Evangelische Kirche Rosenberg, Christstadt Rosenberg, West Preussen. But then, you know, they give the Polish name of the place, but it isn't even the Polish name. They give the next biggest town, Eilau, and, and Sousa is, is Rosenberg. So they, they can be kind of confusing how they list them. They do give you the LDS film number, though, so that's a useful thing you could do. If you have this reference, you go to Family Search, look up the film number on Family Search, and then you really know what the record is. Uh, this is his baptism. And this copy that they have, there was sort of like some of our records back here at the York County History Center, which were very, very early attempts at microfilming. They've done fairly well. 1930s microfilming, that's what this is. There's several microfilm 
versions of these records, and this is one that was done in the early 1930s, so it's not the best microfilm. And a whole bunch of these for church records were done in a very odd way. Left side pages, right side pages, separate films, and the records read the whole way across both pages. So you got to make a copy of one page, and then you want to make a copy of the other page. Yeah, it's, it's not, not, not the best system. And actually, it lists the wrong parents there. His father's name was Gottfried. It wasn't Friedrich, so see, they messed stuff up. Um, just getting into civil records a little bit. They, um, this is the same people here at the bottom are listed, my great-great-grandparents. Uh, it's the marriage of their daughter. This is the second marriage. She, for some reason, married two men that were named Schultz. Her first husband died in World War I. She lived in Berlin, and then she married another guy named Stoltz, who was not related to the first one. And uh, interesting thing about that, her parents listed at the bottom in the 1920s saying they were living in Berlin. So they may have lived there. That's the only reference I have that they ever lived in Berlin. The mother died in 1923 back in their hometown, a couple hundred miles away. And then the father died in that other place, which was further to the east in 1938. And then they have a notation, I think it might be about the first marriage, I'm not sure, but they make these notations up there in the corner. Then this is from, this is one of the, his other children, an infant that died named Oscar. Kind of interesting, he, he signed the death register there. And that's on Ancestry. This is not on Ancestry, civil record again. This is another set of great-great-grandparents on my grandfather's side. And I only found this a couple of years ago. I think it was right before the pandemic. Um, could never find their marriage. There was a reference in the wife's father's death of when they were married, um, but I could never find it. And this is the only record of it. It's a Polish archive in the town that was called in German Allenstein, which is to the east of where these people live. It's now Olenstein. It sounds a lot of the Polish towns, they sound almost like the German towns, but um, it's their, their marriage, the church record is missing, but it says, it gives, I didn't know he had all these names, he's Ferdinand Heinrich Theodore Whiskey, um, and every other thing, it only has Ferdinand, but when he got married, that civil record, they listed all those names, he's from Pomerania, where the records are terrible, this is where, where he's born, Laboon, near Stolp, and that's in Pomerania. Most of the records in Pomerania were lost and it lists his parents as well. Okay. This one has York County connections, but I don't know if you can read it. Yeah, I think you can read it a little bit. This is Johann Christmann Lau, who uh, came in 1732 and has quite a few descendants. He was born in 1696. The family, before they came here, lived in Alsace. Um, I think I know why they moved there. The place they lived in Alsace was in the middle of the woods. You had to travel many miles through a narrow road into the woods. And I think that was to avoid French armies um, because I think they had quite a few problems with invading French armies under Louis XIV. Um, he was born actually, and this is a record again, you can't tell from looking at it, if you look at, over there the far right, the city, or, he's not born in Finnegan, and it says Rohrbach, it says all kinds of dumb stuff. The only thing you can tell is by the film number and what they have the author. Pierre Mazens, that is the church record that it's in, which is not too far over the French border. That's the church record. He's born in a little place called Vinzel, which if you look in the original church records, W-I-N-T-Z-E-L, right up there in the very top corner. You can hopefully see it. His name, uh, his father is Johann Theobald Lau. It's on the second line. It says, I think it's the 23rd of August. Whatever it is, it matches up with his tombstone exactly, the birth date of 1696. And then it lists all the sponsors. They don't really name the mother, it just says, and Johann Theobald Lau, he's a, he's a blacksmith of this place, and his house frau, his wife. Like she didn't have much to do with it, they couldn't give her a name. A lot of times, though, the mothers did not come to the baptism. In fairness, maybe the pastor didn't know what her name was and didn't ask. Um, 
And this is the Hirschner family, Hershinger. It's in the middle there. Johann Georg Hershinger, Weber, he's a weaver as well. And then it says George or Georg Hershinger, also a weaver from the principality of Salzbach. His legitimate son of the Lutheran religion is married with Anna Clara Mosen, Mosen. Uh, that's M-O-S is her maiden name, the deceased, and the, and the pastor didn't know that her father's first name, just put an N there, Mawson. Uh, and then it says that they're, um, pontif she's Catholic at the end, it says that they say the pontifical religion, that means Catholic. So that, and that was in 1718, two of the sons came to York County and settled in Windsor Township. Okay, I talked a little bit about Archeon. So the first one you can really, the, the family search, you can really be spoon fed because they've indexed a lot of things. You don't need to really read German script. It can kind of lead you to it. Ancestry kind of does that as well, although it's a little confusing what they are. They're putting new things on all the time. You have to spend a good bit of money to use it. But, you know, if you do a lot of research, it's probably worth it for you. Archeon is a German website, which was established about 10 years ago. Um, it is a pay site. You pay a yearly fee. It is a 178 euro fee. Yes? You can do it monthly. Okay. Um, so you pay this fee and it's all access. You have access to any records that they have. Uh, they started quite small. Every day they add records. Every day. Um, it's like 150,000 records roughly now as far as church books and continuing to add. My hope is, my belief is, those records from Hessen Nassau that are not available in, except in Salt Lake and Darmstadt, I think they're gonna be putting those on. But time schedule, I don't know. It'll, it'll happen, but I just don't know when. Um, so they kind of can make it somewhat easy for using English and kind of not so much. You have to know how it works. So I highlighted, this is Baden again, uh, and it's the State Church Archive in Karlsruhe. That's the old capital of, of the Grand Duchy of Baden. Um, and then I did Eppingen again. Now, the thing that's nice about Baden is it's alphabetical by town, okay? And then it lists all the books. Now they call deaths aren't toten, they're the burials. Um, they're dang, oh, I can't hardly say it. Bier de Jungen, those are burials, okay? Rather than the totem of the deaths. Mischbuch, Mischbuch is a mashed up book. It's got everything in it. It's got the baptisms, it's got the marriages, it's got the deaths. So on Archeon, if you see Mischbuch, that's what it means. Then this I went, this is a reg, I just went into one of them here. This is a, oh, Trauungen, that's marriages, okay? So marriages um, from 1775 to 1821, and then the confession, that means which religion, REF, that means it's the Reformed. Now, Archeon is primarily Protestant church records. However, two bishoprics in Germany have decided to put, two Roman Catholic bishoprics dioceses have decided to put their records on Archeon. The bishopric of Speyer, which is in the Rhineland Faults, and Paderborn, which is in Northern Germany. And this is that Heininger Wolf marriage, Barbara Wolf. That's Barb Rudy's maiden name. It's not Barb Rudy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they married, I think it's 1809 in August, and they came in 1820 then. There's a lot of information there. So, this, you sort of have to. So, if you're doing Baden Wurttemberg, you basically just have two, two archive databases you're dealing with. Karls Ruhe and Stuttgart, okay? If you're doing Bavaria, there's only one. And, you know, Bavaria is heavily Catholic, um, but there are quite a few Lutherans uh, in the Northern part. So this, the um, State Church Archive of the, Ev the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bavaria is in Nuremberg, big archive. Absolutely, almost none of those records are, the LDS doesn't have any of them. So you're not going to find one family search and you're not going to find one ancestry, only on Archeon. Um, Berlin, you have the central archive of the 
um, Protestant church. That covers a lot of the eastern areas that are no longer in Germany. And then you have the archive that covers the area around Berlin. Hamburg, you have this whole archive that covers northern Germany. Um, but you can see it, they don't all line up with current states. Like Hessen and Nassau is, is not a state. Hessen is all one state, but you have, you know, today you would never talk about electoral Hessen or Hessen. That ended in 1806 when the Holy Roman Empire was ended, okay? But for church archives, they still use it. That's Hessen Castle, all right? But that's all part of the state of Hessen now. But for some reason for the church, they're still talking about the electorate of Hessen, which ended in 1806, over 200 years ago. Um, you know, the Rhineland, the Palatinate, but there's multiple, some of these areas, there's multiple um, churches. Richard? Yes. You may want to note that um, you don't need a subscription to, to drill down through the catalog to see what records they have for which churches. It's to look at. Yeah, you just can't see the records if you don't have it, but at least you'll know whether you want to get a subscription. Yeah. If you, if you only have one town or something you're looking for. These are the two Catholic dioceses that I talked about that are their records are on. Well, let me go back there because I think it had Lower Saxony, that's the old kingdom of Hanover. It has all these different archives. Hildesheim, I told you Paderborn's Hildesheim, the, the bishopric of Hildesheim, which is in that area. Um, you can see you've got to look through a number of those to find it what town you're looking for. And this is all those Eastern parts that are no longer part of Germany. Um, actually, part of it's even Russia. The Northern part of East Prussia is Kaliningrad, which is this weird little island of Russia, which maybe if things work out right, won't be any longer. <laughs> Most of that's all in Poland now. And then this was, um, yes, this was very interesting. I copied this because um, I have, Quite a few ancestors of the Ebler family come from Bavaria. And that area in particular, probably 20% of their old records are still in the parish. Like you have to go there or write to a pastor and hope that they respond to you. Uh, I know my researcher from Munich, she actually like rented a car and went to these places and looked at the original books. They have a plan. Well, let's see if it works. I think it is working that by 2030, that they will have all of them scanned in an Archeon. And then it's up to the individual parishes. Some of these records go back to the 1500s, early to mid 1600s. And the only copy is in the parish. So the plan is um, they can either have their records back or they can put them in Nuremberg once they've been scanned. So that, that's a great project. And this is the page where they show every day they are adding things, every day. So I just copied this. This was on the 2nd of November. They added all these records. So most, most of the church archives in Archeon, you have to know the decanant, that is the deanery. And this is not something that you're just gonna automatically know that this, your town, what deanery it belongs to. So usually I do a little Google search, what is the decanat for this town? And it'll come up um, because it doesn't always follow that it's the next biggest town. It's like some little parish that's, that, that, that's like the central for that conference or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm Lutheran. We have the South York Conference that covers all Southern York County. That's like a dean. If you have the dean of the conference, they call it a deanery or a decanat. I showed you Baden because you didn't have to deal with the decanat. It went right to the town. But yeah, they've added all those just on that day. And there's, since that, every day, Sunday included, they add records. Um, so I was showing you here, this is for Bavaria. This is actually, I'm going to show you, it's June Lloyd. It's her great-grandfather and my great-great-grandfather. So Bavaria, Bayern, that archive, the decanat is Neustadt an der Eich. The parish is Gerhard's Kofen. And I didn't get in the death book, but I went in the, the birth book. I picked ones that aren't particularly easy to read. Some of them are pretty good. Uh, so this is uh, his birth. He's, Bernbaum is a little tiny village. It's part of that parish. And then it says Georg or George. And then it has Natus, and it's the 7th of February. Renatus, the 14th of February. 
and it has the mother, mater, which would be Latin, Magdalena, and then they have, they, they're not quite sure what name to call her, Collerton or Ublerin, and then says she's the daughter of Cunegunda Collerin. So we have a couple uh, generations of illegitimacies and unknown fathers with some of this stuff. But he was born in 1819, so he'd be over 200 years old if he was around. And he lived until 1908. And he came in the 1840s and settled in New York County. First, he was a wood shopper for the furnace at York Furnace, and then worked in York for mm, a couple of years, lived in New York, and then log farm down in Chancellor Township, and has lots of descendants. Uh, Archeon's very good to work with. Um, this Maria Ursula here, who's born in 1728, is one of my ancestors. And on the records through Ancestry and on Archeon, when they did a microfilm, if you look there on the side, it shows what the pages are. So if you look at 14, that's like a microfilm page. You look at 16, that's the microfilm page. When they microfilmed it, they skipped the page. Okay, it was very obvious when you read because it skipped so many months in 1728. And you know, it's the Murphy's Law of genealogy that your ancestor is always going to be on the missing page or whatever. It's the one that's not counted or so. I wrote to them, sent them a nice email, and a week later, they did a beautiful scan, and there she is. All right, so Archeon's a pay site, Ancestors a pay site, Family Search is free, Matricula is Catholic records, and it's free, because the Catholic Church has lots of dough, so. Uh, not quite as extensive yet as Archeon, but they're putting things on continually. And how I find stuff a lot of times is map at the top. Now, maybe Jonathan knows this. For some reason in Europe, archival record groups, they call bonds. Did we call them that here ever or never? They, in the beginning of archival science, yes. But Why are they called bonds? I have no idea. From way. the French. Okay. The French use that term to refer to a particular what we, call, we would call it a series here in, in the United States, a particular specific set of records. Well, they use this term here, and that's what it yeah, means. That's for the French. The French kind of started the archival science, and that's what they use. They, and that's used in Germany, it's used in Russia, it's used in, it's all over Europe that they use that terminology. So I told you about the map. So this is the map, it shows there the North Sea and so it's not all of Germany. Now, if you have Austrian ancestry, Roman Catholic, Austrian ancestry, I think you're in luck. Pretty comprehensively covered. And you can zoom in on this map. I'll show you that in a little bit. Slovenia, if you want to trace the ancestors of Melania Trump, you could probably do it through this website, okay? Pretty comprehensively covered. Luxembourg. Does anyone have Luxembourgish ancestry here? I, I don't but pretty comprehensively covers Catholic country. So um, although certain bishoprics and so forth in Germany are not covered, like we talked about the Archbishopric of Freiburg, they're not on here. That's see Baden and Württemberg, that whole what, Southwest part of Germany, it's all white, there's no little red dots, none. So this tells you where they have. So Deutschland, of course, Germany, that's the largest amount. Austria, which is a much smaller area, it's pretty comprehensive. I was going to, I tried to pull the marriage of um, Mozart and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and Constanze Weber. I had the date, I had that it was in St. Stephen's Cathedral and August the 4th, 1782. And could I find it? No. So I don't know what's going on that it doesn't show up because this was a huge book and it was like 50 pages of August uh, 1782 marriages. But I thought that might be kind of fun to look at. A lot of the, these are um, original scans of the records, which are really nice, especially the Austrian ones. Oh, so yeah, Bosnia even a little bit, Slovenia quite a few. Slovenia is just a little place. I think the Italian one is in the, the southern part of Tyrol. Um, not much for Poland. For some reason, Serbia, that might be places that had some Germans living in them. Um, but this is a up and coming thing if you have Catholic ancestry. I have some ancestors in Bomberg. This only came 
online in the last year, this archive. None of them were available through the LDS. Uh, so there was nothing on ancestry. There was nothing on family search. So these are now on matricula. And um, they were like ship builders that this is a river here that runs through Bomberg. And um, and then they moved and I guess built houses and stuff in what was the Palatinate. Um, so the parish they are in, it shows you where the churches are. Um, Unser Liebe Frau, it's like the Church of Our Lady. And that tells you about the church, and the registers, and there, um, Baim or Boom, the Johannes Georgis, the son of Friedrich Zimmerman, says he's a carpenter and so forth, plus the mother, Katerina, the sponsors. These, I think they're PDF is how they're done. I wouldn't swear to it, but um, I think they're off of a microfilm and you do each page. This I'm a little sad about right now. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent website. However, since this is for the lower, um, lower Rhine, it's basically part of Alsace, okay? And since October the 7th, we have been blocked. Um, we cannot access this. The only kind I sent them, this is a thing on family search that explains about the records. They sent a very nice, it's all in French. If your French is good, you can read it. I did a translation thing. I, I don't know if they were hacked or what happened, um, but it's only open to people that live in Germany, um, Belgium, Luxembourg, and of course, France. So I think something must have happened. They said it was a security problem. And I've checked frequently and it's not up yet. It's really quite good. They have church records, Catholic and Protestant, um, from the earliest time they exist until 1792. What, what was happening in 1792? You've got it. And they only have, and then no more church records. You have to go to the parish if you want the church records, but very good French civil records from that day on. Um, there's a lot of other records in these archives. I didn't mention that. There are notarial records, and that would be in Germany as well. Some you got to chase these things down. Um, like in Germany, they might be on a very local level, like on a town level, or they might be on a, a problem, you know, a whole state level. Um, a lot of times when people got married in Germany, they did inventories, not just deaths. So, you know, that the whole process that we had with our ancestors when they came here and had to do an inventory when they died, that was nothing that was very foreign to them. They would have been quite used to that. It was not like something, that was something they did when some kind of event happened like that, a death, but they also did it marriages quite often. So yeah, it's not available to us now, unfortunately. I hope it's back up sometime soon because it's really quite excellent. It's original images of these records and, um, and they even, what I like about this one, it like shows the records on a shelf. And if you click on it, like the date, it'll say, you should look at this one also because some of the records, now it's in French, but um, it'll say wh where the, the records can be found for that same time period it might be in a different parish. So they give you some clues because sometimes they're not always the same place. Then we get into the Swiss. Um, Probably most of us might have some Swiss ancestry. And Switzerland, they're very independent minded. Um, I have friends that make fun of me because I make the statement. I've never been to Switzerland, so it's not fair, but I do have Swiss ancestry. I say it's the West Virginia of Europe. <laughs> okay, before they got into chocolate and watches and hiding people's money, it was very poor. Okay, because it was mountains and cows. And that actually, when a lot of times they went into more what I would call more uh, civilized areas, they tended to tend cows and do that kind of stuff. That was something they were very good at. Um, you know, if you can chase a cow up and down a mountain when you're in the flatland, it must be really easy. So um, I'll, I'll refrain from saying too much nasty about the Swiss, but um, many, they're, they're divided into 26 cantons. Fiercely independent, the Swiss are. They don't really have, um, any kind of unified system. I mean, the Germans are kind of bad that way too, with having all these different archives and states and different churches and all that stuff. Although like with Archeon, you have this umbrella that kind of is covering them all at this point. Some of the archives are wonderful and have a lot of stuff online. Some have 
nothing. So it's kind of luck of the draw. This is uh, the Canton of Bern, which is the largest archive. And a lot of, if you have Swiss ancestors, it's, there's a good chance you might have some from Bern. Um, they have a lot of their church records online. They're like a PDF kind of thing. There's a whole big long list there and you can get into it. It gets right down to the page. My, there's some benefits to Swiss church records and there's some detriments. They don't elaborate on anything, okay? Maiden names are almost always listed. They go way back. But you, and a lot of times you don't have death records. You have marriages and you have baptisms and they list a maiden name. But you know, in that marriage, why couldn't they say what the wife's father's name was? Oh no, they can't list that or the husband's father. It's just straight names. Um, so it gets, and you know, when you're in some alpine village or whatever, everyone has the same name. So it's like, how do you figure this out who this person is? But um, they go way back and there's lots of people to look at. It's just, they're not very interesting um, because you just have a lot of names and not much else, but you can find things. So that's Baron. Then I went into one. Uh, I have ancestors from Beale who ended up moving into what was um, Botten. It was a Palatine town. It was a, they married in with the Wolf family that married the Heininger. So here this shows the Tauf, the baptisms, era, that would be marriages, Toten, that would be um, deaths. And you see the deaths only start in 1816. So really late. The bar marriages and births early, but that's not so good, much later. And that's all of Switzerland. Some of the archives, like I said, no church records. So they have them, but they're not micro or they're microfilm, but you have to go there. This is Schaffhausen. Schaffhausen is a very northern part of Switzerland. This one's also very good at having all the church records. I've used some of these. Um, would be an ancestor, I think Glenn Burke would descend from it. It's a common one. She was a, um, she married a Tritt and then she married a Beeler. And so um, she was Kern was her maiden name, Veronica Kern. This was some of the nice English language site. And it's very similar about church records that are available. They're over here. So you can, and they were very easy to use. Schaffhausen, it's not very big canton, pretty small. From this, you would never tell what where it is. That it looks like it's in Greece or something. I don't know from that address, but it's uh, Canton Zurich, which of course there's lots of the Mennonite families in Lancaster County are from Canton Zurich. And it's very similar to Bern, where a lot of the records are available. Um, this was kind of interesting. It looks like you have a, a nice database here. This is the town where the Landises are from, Herzl. And if, for months now, if you click on that, Switzerland Catholic and Lutheran church records available online, it says, whoops, we took you to the wrong place. So I guess it's not ready for prime time. It's not up. And they don't have, if you'll note, it's locked. You can only use it here, which I have used it here. But they don't, there is a beautiful index page by page you go, but it's not complete, I guess, because they don't, you, you can't just search by name at home. You have to go either here or the Family History Center. So eventually that'll probably be up, but it's it's not, that's the, the false thing. Then as a finding aid, it's an all German website called GenWiki. I just always Google GenWiki and it comes right up. Um, So I did, that's a search for Essenheim where a lot of families that came to York County are from. Essenheim's records are in Darmstadt and Salt Lake City. There is a copy up here at the Family History Library in York, but uh, you cannot access them. On, they're not on Archeon and they're not on Family Search, only microfilm. So, um, but this tells you a lot about what's available. There's a really good website about Essenheim by Stephen Mosel. Um, if you do Essenheim genealogy, the, the small family, the official family, the Polis family, Prune, Darren, um, there's some wolves, there's a whole bunch of people that came from Essenheim, a lot of them, old York County families, Lease, that's the other one. 
Um, then you have these Orts Familien Bucher. This a whole bunch of them are online now, and there's a link through Gen Wiki to that, which is worth looking. If you have a town that you think you might have ancestors from, you can search and you can see by all that red, all those are or some of those towns. Um, and there's baden württemberg the whole bunch. They're very expensive. I have shelves of these things at home because I have ancestors. Baden has a lot of them. Um, they're very useful, uh, but the, your house might fall down by having too many because they're big, heavy books. Um, so they've gone and moved to online for some of them, which is very useful to use. And it basically lists everyone who ever lived in the town. And then uh, sort of ended with this one. These are the actual books where you can purchase them. Um, some of them are out of print. Um, the Widener Library at Harvard, I think, has a pretty complete set of these that you can get through interlibrary loan, possibly, if they're out of print. Um, they also, my genealogist in Munich, she actually got me some and printed the whole thing from the Bavarian State Library for a relatively modest fee. The postage was a killer, but, uh, you know, so because they're massive, big books. But this list, you know, some of them are still in print and there's a cost to it. You can order them. And that's it. So does anyone have any questions? Yes. What percentage, roughly, of the records were destroyed by the Nazis? Or previously, in other words, I have a whole bunch of the Nazis didn't did not purposely destroy any records. Not that I'm defending them for anything, because okay. they wanted to prove that their Aryan ancestry and all that nonsense. Actually, they spent quite a wasted quite a lot of time doing that sort of thing, prove that people didn't have Jewish ancestry. So it was vital. That's why they did some of those microfilm projects in the 30s, because they wanted to preserve those records so that they could prove ancestry. Um, and that's, they've sort of changed the, those Orts Familien books. Originally, they called them Orts Sippen book, which means like the tribe, and that's considered politically incorrect. So they did not destroy records. They, in some of those Eastern provinces, they went to great lengths to try to preserve. East Prussia went and put them in some kind of mine, a mine shaft, and they had a prisoner of war camp there. And at the end of the war, they somehow started a fire in the mine and like they all burned. So some of those provinces lost a lot of records for those reasons. I'm kind of lucky the West Prussia, I don't know what they did, the area I'm from, I lucked out, but my grandfather had an ancestor in Pomerania. I think they were further to the West. They thought nothing was going to happen. And, you know, the Soviet army came through and a whole heck of a lot happened. Um, they prepared a little better and put the, play, the record to better place. You know, some things, they move things to be safe because of a lot of church records are in small villages. I mean, you have some things that were lost just because there was a fire in the parsonage or in the church or something that happened in 1780 or something. So I have a bunch of German brick walls. What are the chances they might show up in the next four or five years? Well, are your brick walls really brick walls? That's the question. Yeah. There's a heck of a lot of records out there now. Okay. Keep trying. That's right. Yes. Richard, on the uh, first uh, birth record that you showed, um, there are little crosses. That on... means they died, usually. Right. And if they have it in where the parent is, if there's a cross where the parent is, would that be that one of the parents was was deceased? The trouble is sometimes you think that that record means that the child died as an infant. And mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll mark it in and they died and they were 80 years I old. I have some that they have a year. or they'll That's do helpful. So that, that probably means yeah. it's probably the person. Mm -hmm. It's a baptism. It's probably the person for the baptism. Okay. And I, there were a few that I came across that had the cross in the parents where the parents were named. And of course, my the ones I'm looking at, they were all soldiers. Okay. And so I'm thinking that that meant that one of the parents. Um, See, there's yeah, a notation there for my hiding. Oh, I think it says he went to America. I think that's what it I says had, under. Yeah, that. I had a couple of those too. Yeah, now the one up at the top, top very right. There it says 1814. Okay. See, so, so he he was born in 1784. This Johann Jakob, whatever the heck it is, 
Hitler or something like that. And um, he died in 1814. Okay. Okay. All right. Now that's what yeah. There you have. There's a um, Heinrich. Um, this one over here, and it gives the exact date in 1784. So he was an infant. There's one 1824, 1862. So okay. This, these pastors are pretty good. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just have this cross, and you're like, oh, did they die? And yeah, and you that, know they that's lived what so, I had a lot of. Bit. But it was often the, where if there was a year and it was further uh, out, then it, I knew that the child lived maybe six years or 10 mm -hmm. years or whatever. But I just wondered about with it in the parent's name. It it's possible they could do that too. Well, the... See, what confused me, right there, there's a family book. Burtonburg has those. So under the parents, it lists what page they are in the family book. And that family book says the family went in 1834. Mm -hmm. So because she was married and living in York County in 1830, I thought, I don't think this is right. But see, she emigrated separate from her father and her sister. Okay. They, it, it's not the whole family emigrated in 1834, just the father and several. Because I have the New York um, ship list when they came in. I don't have anything for her for a ship list. I don't know what name she was under. Any other questions? Yes. Richard, a couple of the European websites you showed were in English. They have English versions. So like Archeon, you can choose language. It's okay. not all in English, but it'll guide you through a lot of so it. The website itself allows you the option of mm -hmm. the, the original language or, or English. Correct. And then have, if you get to a site that does not have that, have you tried to use translation? Yeah, things, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can fake my way through a lot of it, okay. but um you can do that if there's something that you know it's really important you know what this says just you know cut and paste into one of those programs and it'll tell you that that french email that i had that's how i did that yes so you're saying that anybody that came over in say 1754 from the darmstadt area really the records are only going to be some of the records are on archaeon like i have it's Hessen Nassau is what the archive right. is, the church archive. So I have the Wintermeyer family is from the Wiesbaden area. They came from a town called Schierstein, which is right on the Rhine. Schierstein's not on, but Mr. Went, that was where his wife was from. His his family was from Dotsheim. Dotsheim is on. So just cool. Sorry. it's a luck of the draw. You got to look around. <laughs> And I think they're going to be put on. It's just a matter of when. Any other questions? Now you're all confused. <laughs> no? Okay. I tried to make it simple, but hopefully you understood. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Our meeting is adjourned. Richard, there's a meeting. Oh, okay. What is it? And not many. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I think they, they moved a lot. Well, that's a good excuse. Yeah. 20% of the rest of them were lost. Well, the Pomeranians, that's bad.